Metal Gear Solid 2 was informally dubbed the Hollywood game. But while we've already covered how this relates to the game's status as a blockbuster sequel, it goes deeper. Throughout much of the 20th century, Hollywood was where many Americans learned their history. Movies as an industry became so dominated by the culture and language of the United States that other forms of cinema simply all but withered away. Hollywood became so cherished and important that it became a large part of American identity, part of how we not only saw our pasts, in other words, but as well as how we dreamed about our futures. In this, part 6 of our MGS2 retrospective existence, we'll discuss this deeper meaning behind the context of Sons of Liberty as, in some sense, the epitome of a Hollywood game. In 1934, the American historian Charles Beard gave a presidential address not unlike G.W. had back in 1789 on the second floor balcony of Federal Hall in Lower Manhattan. Speaking as the president of the American Historical Association, Beard then made a key distinction for our purposes between what he called history as past actuality and history as thought, or what we might more appropriately call here history as memes. But what this really boils down to is the difference between all the events in the past as they really took place and how those events are interpreted by the present. As Orwell's famous dystopian slogan puts it more succinctly, who controls the present controls the past, who controls the past controls the future. In the near centuries length of time between Beard's address and the release of MGS2, we have seen just what lies beneath our everyday ideas about truth and history and even the empirical or scientific or natural method. We see this by the proxy of American movies. Though they tend to typically only express one subjective way of thinking about not only the medium but also the world, expressing a point of view where good guys tend to win out if they try their best and evil is always vanquished by the end of the film, We've lived with movies inside our minds for so long that there are those of us who take these fairy tale structures of narrative as self evident, if not also unstated, principles of real everyday life. Yet what movies have possibly really been teaching us all along is how to lie, to lie so convincingly. Not even we recognize the distinction between the lie and the truth anymore. Scholar of totalitarianism Hannah Arendt once said, Totalitarian is any society where distinguishing between reality and non-reality no longer much matters. Could it be that in the age of Hollywood, 24-hour news, infotainment, the internet, and even video games, that in such an age, that very ability Arendt spoke of has been worn down? MGS2 poses this question, and it does so in a number of ways. As a postmodern work of popular art, MGS2 draws on the work of biologist Richard Dawkins and meme theory to posit in a way it is turtles all the way down. Nobody, either today, yesterday, or tomorrow, experiences a form of absolute reality, rather a version or interpretation of reality that by necessity competes against its rivals. And it competes not as a part of humanity's will to truth, but what Friedrich Nietzsche dubbed our innate will to power. The way our genes, according to Dawkins, struggle for growth and greater and greater odds of survival, so too do our prevailing ideas, our memes, selfishly struggle as well. It has little or nothing to do with truth or total recall of absolute reality. It is a fight between fragments of perceived reality over survival of the fittest on a mimetic scale. In general, MGS2 depicts these ideas through The Patriots, 
a shadowy group who rule the world and subvert democracy by controlling not content, but context. Theirs is a kind of neo-totalitarian society that has long moved beyond eugenics into mimetic cleansing. If the totalitarian movements at the start of the 20th century sought to stay alive by literally breeding new races into being and purging their civilizations of those deemed biologically inferior, the neo-totalitarian near future portrayed in Sons of Liberty skips this messy step completely by targeting George Orwell-style difference of thought itself. Shaping what kinds of thoughts and minds to think them with can possibly exist, the patriots formerly accomplished by regulating the flow of information within society. One of the most important ways they did this, though, was not through the news media, we're told, as you might expect. No, it was through culture itself, and that includes Hollywood movies. Jack, how far do you think the Patriots' digital control extends? I don't really know, but it probably influences a lot of what goes on in our everyday lives. Even mundane things like which movies and songs become a hit and what kind of clothes we wear? I think taste would be the easiest thing to manipulate. I mean, think about the kinds of film and bands everyone wants to go to see. It's whatever's at the top of the charts. And if the charts are made up... Exactly. But you can't really control individual taste. It's too closely tied to personality. I don't know about that. Trends have always been about following the leader. Not necessarily. The age of direct personal interaction is over. So is the idea of word of mouth communication. Rose, you have any friends you've met online? Hmm? Mm, yeah, I do. How many? Well, if you count only the ones I talk to a lot, I'd say about 20. How many of those have you actually met? <laughs> One or two tops. Uh-huh. That's how it is for everyone, I guess. And even if your online buddies had fake identities and were circulating false information, you'd have no way of knowing. Fake identities? Right. And there'd be no way for you to know for sure. Well, what about people who do meet face-to-face -face, then? Like us. Us? Have you ever really shown me the real you? I wouldn't even know the real me myself this topic of Hollywood, MGS2 introduces right away with its many nods to films like Titanic and use even of a real life movie composer, Harry Gregson Williams. Just like in the movie by James Cameron, the protagonist, Ryden, and his love interest are actually named Jack and Rose. And though we're given an almost voyeuristic level of insight into their relationship throughout the game, there's little about it by the end that isn't revealed to be in effect an illusion one created through an unspoken mutual arrangement between them using Hollywood magic. There are all these tourists around you in front of the Federal Hall. A group of middle-aged Japanese ladies came up and asked me which building it was that King Kong was climbing in the movie. I said it was probably the Chrysler building. And then you showed up and started mouthing off. You were like, no, it's the Empire State. I said the Chrysler building was in Godzilla. <laughs> we started arguing and I forgot all about the tourists. I was insisting that I was right and you were doing the same. The next thing we knew, the Japanese women had gone away and we ended up going to the Skyscraper Museum to see who had the better recall. We argued all the way to Battery Park. And for nothing. Since the museum was closed, we went our separate ways from the museum. And then I found you again by coincidence out in the base corridor. An amazing coincidence that we were actually working at the same place. That night we went up to the top of the Empire State. It was so beautiful. I could look down on the Chrysler building from 120 stories above ground. I felt overwhelmed. I didn't care anymore who was right. And that was our first date. We watched King Kong in your apartment a bunch of times that night. Didn't sleep till morning. Hmm. If it weren't for that coincidence, we wouldn't be together. I know. I'm sorry, Jack. I'm taking up your time again. What? Take care. Rose and Jack perform the script of an American romance. Like their names suggest, little about them is authentic or non-staged. The magic of movies has penetrated so deeply inside their lives that both actually prefer their fantasy that they've co-written together to the grim reality 
where Rosemary is actually a spy and Jack's a war orphan with only the shallowest possible sense of a self. Fittingly, the civil war that Jack fought in as a child soldier, another demarcator of totalitarianism, was in Liberia, the nation in Africa founded by former American slaves in 1847, on the cusp of the American Civil War. The dream of both America and Hollywood movie making that Liberia contextualizes, simply put, is the dream that the past can always be, at will, discarded or reinvented. But just as the Liberians could never actually gain independence from the memes of civil war, racial inequity, and global economics that they inherited as sons of the US, aka the original Sons of Liberty, Ryden tries in vain to reinvent everything about himself, even his inner world, as a Hollywood movie. Yet Jack winds up literally right back where he started, face to face with his former commander and foster father from Liberia, Solidus, forced to fight in yet another one of the Patriots' civil wars. The Patriots themselves think that the advent of the 21st century information age, which ironically gave birth to them themselves, is a historical occurrence they have the power to reverse. But the scariest aspect of MGS2 may be that the power of movie making, of in other words imaginatively reinterpreting history and passing on memes, is no less dangerous once it's grown beyond the Patriots' abilities to regulate and control. Now everyone is capable of twisting the flow of information as we see fit, and because of this we are all in danger of being drowned by the flood. Because of how MGS2 divides our impulses to pass things on from our belief in the moral necessity of telling the truth, this new American style revolution, where truth can be passed on by anyone, where Hollywood has been democratized, does not fix the Hollywood problem, does not fix the Patriots. Not remotely, it just multiplies this danger of taking hold of the flow of information. With no central authority to regulate what gets passed on and what gets forgotten, under this paradigm of the network, we don't lose Hollywood, we gain a legion of Hollywood pretenders. Whether you believe it or not, the balance of power rests in the hands of the Patriots. They regulate the country's various interests through controlled presentation, staging a drama that is palatable to the general masses. Can you imagine what would happen if they ceased to function? <sighs> Picture a massive political vacuum, a space that every power monger will try to fill for their own greedy ends. I'm talking about an unregulated power struggle, panic, civil war, chaos. Just as movie making merely requires good enough lies, many of the characters in MGS2 attempt to make the movie version of their lives and their memories indistinguishable from reality. In this way, they are all enslaved somewhat by the Hollywood meme. In other words, the inner realization that truth is not neutral, but a state of mind or a context with which to be controlled. The initial premise of MGS2's plant chapter is that the real enemy of the game will be a former Navy SEALs anti-terror unit called Dead Cell. But as we play the game, we come to realize that there's no real enemy at all, it's all smoke and mirrors. Everyone is playing the same game. The whole scenario, like Jack and Rose's relationship somewhat, is a mutually beneficial lie to all parties involved. And this includes of course the player and the game developers. Dead Cell get to act out the movie of revenge against the Patriots and their society, whom they contemptuously blame for causing the desolation of their unit six months prior. The mad bomber Fat Man decides to betray Dead Cell and become one of the Patriots' lapdogs, sacrificing himself in the name of the fame his story, his infamy, will gain him in the form of a hit blockbuster movie after he's dead. Raiden gets to feel like an actor playing the role of Solid Snake, his hero while Solidus gets to feel like an actor playing Big Boss, his hero. The Patriots are even in on the fun, getting to fantasize that they have omnipotence, an ability to trigger and solve any scenario that they stage. Otacon can for a time trick himself into thinking that if there was a history book of these events of the Big Shell, he would go down as a good big brother, a savior. EE, e., meanwhile, only became a cryptographer and computer programmer for the NSA 
to, in some ways, play the part of her own personal hero, the man who actually ruined her life, Big Brother Hal. Solid Snake and Revolver Ocelot may be the only characters who admit to themselves what they're doing isn't, strictly speaking, real. It is this power of self-awareness that allows them to be above the fray for most of the game, adopting and dropping personas at will. But even Snake succumbs to having faith in a lie. He believes Ocelot's play acting as Liquid, convinced by the performance despite himself. The same succumbing to belief happens, tragically, to the character Olga Gerlukovich, who, despite spending most of the game no less deftly maneuvering her various roles than Snake or Ocelot, pays for her belief in the existence of history with her life. She thinks that if she plays by the Patriots' rules, she'll eventually be free of their control and regain the liberty of being a mother. Olga does this believing her father died trying to fight the Patriots, never understanding it was precisely Sergei's very act of insurrection the Patriots desired most. With it, the Patriots were able to tell lies with half-truths in the first chapter of the game, The Tanker. Sergei provided them the perfect opportunity to begin their so-called S3 plan, a next-generation, Hollywoodized pseudo-reality called Selection for Societal Sanity. In the end, MGS2 pulls back its facade down to the virtual bone, exposing itself and its world as nothing much more than a fiction. The game's extreme ambiguity is in part a comment on history as much as on Hollywood movies. It leaves us with the idea that now as ever, the best we can ever do is make a mental movie of our lives that we can actually believe in. Just like the best movies are nonetheless still part fiction, the most sincerely believed so-called facts will inevitably contain grains of half-truths, faith-based reasoning, and even self-serving lies. This is proven, of course, by nothing more than the structure of MGS2 itself. The game's frequent use of imagery from monotheistic notions of heaven and hell, as well as of churches, are just as much about what Umberto Eco in the 1980s called the cult culture, the culture of worshipping plastic secular idols, which mean nothing except themselves. By playing through MGS2, we believe in MGS2. We want on some level for it to deceive us. Yet something having meaning does not depend on that thing being true, as the experience of completing the game teaches us firsthand. The conversation over what's true versus false, sacred versus profane, right versus wrong, is a never-ending one. History is what we make it. One of the biggest direct Hollywood influences on MGS2 was Curtis Hansen's 1997 neo-noir, L.A. Confidential. The film follows a member of the LAPD who begins to discover much of what the public is told when it comes to crime, law, and order is actually a well-rehearsed drama designed to cater to their own basest instincts. We find in the film a rot that seeps into every facet of LA society, from its television shows to its prostitution rings, its police department, and its tabloid magazines. Los Angeles is portrayed as a dream factory where, in exchange for producing palatable facsimiles of reality, those who truly run the show give themselves the license to do whatever it takes to stay in control of the story. In MGS2, even more than LA Confidential, it is not external power sources or authorities we are warned about first and foremost. No, it is the power that we represent ourselves the power of we the people. That is the latent power behind the scenes the game wants to address. The power specifically of our belief. Look at Raiden's journey throughout MGS2. He continues to, on some level, believe in his mission right up until the very end of it. Even as one by one, the premises he's been told are exposed as shams by the very ones who've contrived them, the Patriots, Raiden continues to believe, to have faith in the reality of the situation. Yet at the same time, he seems to deny that he's having faith at all. He seems to believe that it is the truth with a capital T. 
even when this principle is contradicted by all the other truths that he's discarded along the way. It would never occur to Ryden to question this fundamental assumption that somewhere concealed by all the big shells, there is a there there, there is a reality one can contact directly and not by the proxy of faith alone. But there may not be. The patriots, who themselves, Snake tells us in the end, may be nothing more than a sort of fiction, stage this pseudo-reality using real people who really think it's all real as the ultimate cast of actors. They even allow Raiden glimpses at grains of truth allow him to learn about their massive top-secret data filtration system, Arsenal Gear. They seem to allow EE to infect one of Arsenal's core AIs, GW, with a catastrophic virus. The Patriots twist even the death of EE into just another one of their glorious set pieces. It's all representative of the breakup of truth as opposed to lie. As the information age has ballooned in size, the more that everyday people have found new needs for what postmodern theorist Jean-Francois Lyotard dubbed in 1979's The Postmodern Condition a narrative. Formerly grand narratives, stories that explain the world more completely and perfectly than could ever be expected of the so-called truth, did this job. We are too familiar with the ambiguity of our lives today, according to postmodern theory. Lyotard thought that in the postmodern age, people resign themselves in place of grand narratives to at least little or micro-narratives, in other words, more relativist concepts of truth that the believer is prepared to drop or ignore at a moment's notice, in order to keep alive at least some semblance of belief in a truth that does not require faith, that is a self-evident truth, an almost objective truth, a truth that will broker no argument. MGS2 is full of micro-narratives, literally. The plot twists and turns and sheds skins just like a real-life snake, transforming truth as it functions in the game not into completely solid or liquid shapes, but into a hinterland zone, a solidus state, referring in physics to quote, the temperature at which melting of a substance begins, but does not necessarily melt completely, end quote. In other words, MGS2 expresses the ethos of the postmodern age as one where our solid truths, the ones we can completely believe in, and disregard the requirement of faith to believe in, are beginning to give way to a realization that they are not the capital T truth, but merely one version among a sea full of many. A deluge of truths that give us no indication of which we ought to believe in. Yet we still cling to the idea of a solid fact, as Stillman says, a proper ideology which makes no difference for time or place. We cling to this concept of solidness, even as we observe it beginning to change states. In this regard, in this rather heavy-handed metaphor, we are like the viewer of LA Confidential, who becomes aware the film is aware it is lying to us. Yet does not see that by the end it will be the very desire on the audience's part to be lied to that the film will ultimately want to deconstruct. The Patriots tell us that part of testing their S3 plan is recreating the conditions that gave rise to the Shadow Moses incident back at MGS1, but they seem to leave out a key difference. Raiden will know much more than Solid Snake did that everything is a lie. The question the Big Shell incident seems contrived to test is, Will this make even the slightest bit of difference? At the start, Colonel tells Raiden that Rose was selected for this assignment to provide him with more of a reason to fight, a story to guide his will. Yet it is part of the plan for Raiden to eventually be told the truth that Rose is a plant, as the name of the entire chapter, at least in part, hints towards no less of a plant than Raiden himself as a replacement, an inadequate replacement, for Solid Snake. As Rose herself says, I lied to you, but I wanted to be caught. The fact that Raiden willed never to second guess that coincidence that first brought them together is perhaps evidence that the will to survive and to find meaning in our lives can sometimes actually conflict against our abilities and predilections as human beings 
to know or even want to know the truth. To admit that we have faith in something. To admit that we may not be right. This produces inevitably an anxiety so long as we refuse to face the necessity of faith in the postmodern age. It's a lesson that Ryden spends the entire game having to work out for himself. This in a way is the essence of the micro-narrative or solidus idea that I try to put forward. That once we latch on to a so-called truth, or even when we abandon one for another in the light of new so-called facts, never do we lose faith in the underlying idea of an imminently knowable universe of truth that in some sense becomes really true only in Hollywood fashion the moment we will it to be. In the final boss fight, the Patriots say the victor will either be Solidus, their creation, or Raiden, his creation. Either way, it seems to imply, the Patriots win. The Patriots prove their power and control. Yet you fight anyway, under the story, the micro-narrative they provide that if you should die, a network of decentralized nanomachines will automatically kill both Rose and Olga's child. Does such a system really exist? It's impossible to know for sure. We can only have faith that it does. It provides a meaningful enough context, even only as an idea, that Raiden has no choice but to believe it, to believe, in other words, his life really matters, that reality is actually happening here, that his failure will really result in a woman and a child dying. There's no reason for me to believe any of this. You understand that? Of course, but you also have no choice but to believe. <sighs> the irony about America, since perhaps World War II, at least, is that while our domestic politics become ever the more contested and sensationalized and factional, our foreign politics and economic policies stay basically the same. Why is that? Because regardless of your politics, our global system has been set up that's become simply, today, too big to fail. No politician can affect change if doing so will mean throwing the entire world into shambles and ruin. It's much easier to fight over culture war issues than face the powerlessness of this situation. Yet the grim reality is that in the so-called New World Order, democracy as we know it is past a certain point rendered now impossible. Democracy rests upon principles like the voter being obliged to pursue their own self-interests. In a tremendous leap of circular reasoning, we have made it in everyone's best interest whether we admit it or not, to keep things more or less the same. In this way, our political world resembles nothing more than the norms and mores of Hollywood. We can all make different takes or types of Hollywood productions, but in the end, all of them, at least to some extent, will just be versions or variations on the same central Hollywood theme, the Hollywood tradition. Just as market forces at the turn of the century when MGS2 was being made often prevented any big studio from going too far off script or getting too artsy, actually implementing genuine change would likely spell financial, political, and civilizational suicide. Yet due to surface level cultural conflicts between what at bottom, if we're being honest, are really sibling ideas of America, left versus right, metropolitan versus provincial, it remains in every American's own self-interest not to question the basic idea that public opinion really shapes what happens. It's something that we're not supposed to admit that we just have faith in, that we're supposed to believe is really true. Just like Raiden versus Solidus, each faction within the US's socio-political makeup depends upon fighting against their supposed opposite antagonist to be able to believe that their side truly exists and in turn, that the fight really matters. In MGS2's first half, we see this idea conveyed indirectly by how the premise that a real terrorist threat exists on the big shell seems to strengthen Raiden's belief in himself and his side of the conflict. In the end, Raiden, even deprived of the pretext of genuine grand narrative style belief, has no choice but cling to his faith in micro-narratives that can explain his identity and inform his will to struggle and survive. It's only once he becomes willing to admit that this is an act of faith, an act of faith worth making, 
that Raiden seems to graduate from the events of the game and move on to live his own private life. MGS2 is about, in effect, what happens to human psychology in the age of mass communication. Our minds and the memes they house are predisposed to be self-serving, as Dawkins in The Selfish Gene explains. There may be more than a grain of truth in the idea that prior to the dawn of the internet, what we called reality was something of a socially manufactured construction, dictated to us by Washington, Manhattan, and LA. But what if we need a social construction, a consensus, to believe in our reality at all. It would be, as MGS2 predicted, inevitable that in the wake of the death of grand narratives, we would crave something, anything, to call the truth. And given how democratizing the digital age is, we have all the tools and techniques formerly only possible from Hollywood to falsify this truth at will. But the rush to do so fails to take in the gravity of what the breakdown of grand narratives might, in fact, signify. Often in the YouTube era, we hear over and over again the idea that the system is lying to us, suppressing the real truth. But what if that's inescapable? What if all truths are, in some sense, half-truths? What if we are doing the exact same thing? What if the entire conflict between official and unofficial narratives is really and only a power struggle? What if the truth is not truth, but merely belief? What cultural and countercultural factions would really be fighting over then is which of their different competing versions of the truth will be believed. This means what nobody with a cause or ideology to sell is willing to admit is the very opening of the door to any truth we can convince the world of letting in proves that truth as we thought we knew it in the pre-digital era may in fact have never existed. I'm not saying truth is totally relative though. What I'm saying that I think MGS2 is saying is that truth in of itself is totally inaccessible. The rise of digital communication only seems to make the truth easier to access and convey. It's possible that to the contrary, the only truth it makes really clear is that there is no function of truth without context. And there is no context without subjective belief. This is my son. I taught him everything. Jack, I never thought I'd see you again. You know me? You don't remember. Your name, your skills, everything you know, you learn from me. Raiden may choose to believe he's a man without a past, but the horrors he experienced happened whether he accepts them or not. See, truth is not totally relative. By ignoring them, all Raiden's done is deprived himself an ability to decide how to think about them. The mind often cannot accept the idea that things happen for no good reason. The reason that Raiden's afraid of the night is he's unwilling, as he says himself, to deal with complications. It's, as the script explains parenthetically, the reason Raiden doesn't tell Rose about his childhood. Because he's, quote, protecting himself, not her. Raiden hates more than anything in the world his own past. And why? Because he can do nothing to change it. And given Raiden's preference for Hollywood storytelling as a method of finding meaning, he doesn't know how to passively interpret his life according to any known script. Even at the very end of the game, He's asking Rose to tell him who he is. He still doesn't really understand that he's got to figure that out for himself. Does what Raiden went through make him a hero or a villain? Neither. In terms of moral responsibility, as we conventionally grasp it, as Hollywood movies would tell us, he is both in some respects a victim and a victimizer. He is both right and wrong. It's far too complicated for any Hollywood story. So he just turns away, compartmentalizing it like the Pentagon does with inconvenient or sensitive information. MGS2 draws parallels between American society in terms of foreign policy or the military and American psychology as expressed through Hollywood norms. In other words, the Hollywood context. If we have no genuine power to change our world or our lives, we still have the liberty to choose what and how to believe. But that takes thinking for ourselves. 
and admitting that we've been kidding ourselves all along. Without free will, there is no difference between submission and rebellion. My only real choice is to put an end to this charade. Let me at least have the freedom to end it myself. In such a world as I've just described, truth no longer matters nearly so much as belief, as faith. Faith is how we explain our lives and pass records of it down as history. Faith, not truth, determines who wins elections, let alone Hollywood awards. The more willing we are to admit that to ourselves, the better off, MGS2 seems to argue, we will be. But the only liberty that's possible comes with the price required of any genuine faith. Faith, as portrayed in the monotheistic story of Abraham and Isaac, can only be faith in the face of knowing it very well may be wrong. So the moral, if you like, of MGS2, at least in my interpretation, is not to give in to some sort of nihilistic fatalism and simply do whatever society tells you, safe in the belief that there's nothing you can do to change things. No, it's to regain the sincerity of bygone ages, not by repeating their mistakes and orthodox ways of thinking, and take our beliefs as tantamount to truth. Rather, MGS2, through the conclusion of the game, seemingly implores the player to realize that even if you are wrong, your purpose, which you should take very seriously, is to find a faith that you find worthy of risking being wrong about, and of never forgetting that at the end of the day, it is just a faith. Raiden knows Rose has lied, just as she knows about him, but in the end the couple reconcile, realizing that together they can believe in something that's worth passing on. History, culture, art, and politics in the 11th hour of MGS2 are not unlike Isaac at the end of the religious parable with Abraham redeemed. But they're only redeemed by letting go somewhat of the grand narrative. They are redeemed, in other words, not by the interplay of truth versus falsehood, but by belief versus disbelief. A system, even one as artificial as Hollywood, or even the nastiest bits of American politics, only becomes a mistake once it loses its sincerity, MGS2 suggests, only when it gets too preoccupied with the words themselves, and not with the belief that underlines them. Right or wrong, we have an obligation as human beings, arguably, to continue telling stories and recording our beliefs and believing in them, like we always have since the earliest cave drawings. It is only when we become too numb, or cynical, or afraid, to admit when we aren't measuring up to how we assume we ought to be in theory, that we trade sincerity for a dubious sense of certitude, a half-truth, a political correctness that avoids offending and does not, or so we think, fall short. But if we can't be honest about our own flaws, about our own messy history, about not always having total control or liberty, then, and arguably only then, do we really fall short. Only then do half-truths and Hollywood illusions run the risk of emancipating us not only from our anxieties, but from reality itself. The pseudo-reality of MGS2, Irony of Ironies, tells more truth with self-aware lies than most stories tell beneath the banner of total truth. Even if the player lacks much in the way of liberty to change the outcome of the game's events, how we play out our part upon this stage, as on any, how we act and react to the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, that is the only measure of our existence that counts. The time we spend, the feelings and thoughts we experience, those are what matter. As a micro-narrative, even though, thanks to ambiguity, how much MGS2's central plot really matters or can be said actually took place is pretty up in the air. In the postmodern digital age, which the game so beautifully and iconically epitomizes, that is the only truth that actually makes a difference, that deserves passing on. At the time of MGS2's development, a genre of Hollywood was all the rage called disaster movies. In the New World Order of the post-Cold War age, 
people were bored because history, as one academic famously declared, had ended. Disaster movies were a way of reminding the masses that big events and catastrophes were still possible, even if wide-scale wars no longer were. The Cold War, after all, informed much of the American identity, and in its absence, that identity was surprisingly undefined, missing its substance. MGS2's story is, of course, itself a kind of disaster movie. But though we've mentioned ways that MGS2's story and themes embody the concept of a Hollywood game, we haven't yet mentioned how this equally applies to the gameplay and overall design. Every element of the big shell has a function that's rendered visible for us, and often enough, it's shown to us, not told. This is crucial to the sense of Hollywood hyperreality MGS2 sets out to provide. We begin the plant chapter in the deep sea dock of Strut A. This area contains submarines that we can see, ostensibly used by the shell's staff to check for damages to the structure underwater. There's a roof which takes us into Strut A proper. Strut A is a hydroelectric pump necessary to hydraulically disseminate the contaminated seawater throughout the filtration plant. We find the pump mechanism itself in the southern section of the strut and the control room in the north. Strut B, where SEAL Team 10 faces off against VAMP, houses the transformer room, an electric generator that we're told powers the big shell itself. In the game script, the scene with VAMP is described through sensory details that bring it to life. Gunfire has destroyed the room lighting and the transformers in the middle of the chamber here. Sunshine comes through a quote, narrow slit of skylight, providing the gory tableau a naturalistic light. This, the script indicates, quote, gives the place a solemn church-like air, end quote. These visual details heighten the sense of reality by using the environment as more than mere set dressing. The incidental details like spent bullet casings, bloody corpses, and signs of a body that's been dragged along the hallway make this feel like a real location to some extent. Selling us on the lie, we also find other little details like sparking damaged electrical equipment and more importantly, little postcards and posters that we can find, presumably that were put up in the lockers by staff members. These details occur through gameplay, not cutscenes. That's important. These are, of course, examples of memes, artifacts, history, and culture. One postcard seems to frame and silhouette the famous Brooklyn Bridge. The name of the Transformer Room is, of course, an ironic pun. It's here the mission transforms in more ways than one, as does Raiden. We encounter here the horrifying realization of ourselves that we're up against apparently supernatural enemies, as well as what a psychoanalytical critic might dub the castration effect of coming face to face with our own inadequate reflection by the proxy of J.G. Pliskin, the man who's much more capable of being Snake than we are, even though we're the only ones who ostensibly are supposed to be. Raiden watches the mini disaster movie on the BC Connecting Bridge with Fortune, and it leaves in its wake real damage to the facility that we can observe through gameplay in real time. The exposed water line running in the opposite direction as us seems to prove that this really is a filtration plant, as do distant details like the construction crane. At any time on a connecting bridge in MGS2, we can observe details about each strut that currently surrounds us. This too brings home the sense of pseudo-reality, alongside the pointed absence of music when we're outside. Strut C, where Stillman awaits, is an echo of the tanker, replete with kitchen and a pantry. This strut is the plant's residential area, and its details show, without telling, how many personnel were really needed to run the big shell. In theory. All of these meticulously crafted details are, of course, part of how the game lies to you, but they go a long way towards selling us the movie, the interactive movie, that is, MGS2. The Big Shell's layout brings across the key conceit of a network as much as the non-linear aspects of the gameplay. The bomb disposal mission, for example, can be accomplished either clockwise or counterclockwise, a subtle nod to Fat Man's origin story. Fat Man's father had worked as a clockmaker. It was being around clocks as a child that led to Fat Man's fixation with timers and bombs. How frequently you use the codec to call Pliskin or Stillman in this section is entirely up to you, just as much as the order you go about disposing the bombs. 
The sense of non-determinacy speaks to the game's sense of pseudo-realism, something we'll discuss more momentarily. Another important element here is Raiden's never covered bomb disposal in VR. It's an encounter with reality for the first time, a face-off with fear, as Stillman calls it. Or so it's all made to seem. In reality, the bombs are not the threat they're first made out to be. Stillman thinks Fat Man's mind is as reliable to read as a well-wound clock. But unlike clocks or machines, people can change. And Fat Man has changed. Stillman compares Fat Man's approach when we first meet him to a religion, but even the most devout believer is capable, after all, of changing their faith. Hollywood is a kind of religion when you think about it. Yet the best movies keep their faith alive, not by orthodoxy, but by moving their medium forward in new directions and with new, sometimes even subversive, techniques. Fat Man's subversion of Stillman is a version of MGS2's subversion of its audience. We all assumed we'd get a repeat of MGS1 like clockwork, and we were in a way, just as Stillman is, both right and wrong. MGS2 is true to the spirit of MGS1, just like it is to the spirit of Hollywood. It's this faith, this spirit, not the words, the rote repetition, that makes it the revolutionary Hollywood game. There's the importance also of cultural symbols and famous figures. The Big Shells, described as a landmark for environmental protection, Stillman is said to be the best bomb disposal expert in the world, and Snake is, of course, one of history's most famous soldiers. These are all memes which fame or infamy allow to take on lives of their own. One particularly important infamous symbol for us here is Satan, also known as the Devil. Evil is the way that American culture, through Hollywood movies, explains the unknown, and often simply the different or the disappointing. Vamp is a key case in point. His monstrousness, as his bisexuality, are both aspects of the name. Vamp became such a bizarre creature when a church bombing, just not a famous church like the one during Stillman's last job, left him as a kid, buried in the rubble, forced to drink the blood of his own dead family to survive. Ever since, Vamp has embraced this fate that he cannot change. He's actually no more in control of his life than any other character, even if the terrorist, as he says, may be the only ones telling the truth. But through the instantly recognizable Hollywood construct of the vampire, Vamp retains some semblance of apparent agency through his apparent evil. The way he tears through SEAL Team 10 with bloody abandon is not only horrifying, it's presented as almost unnatural, sinful even. The rush that he seems to get out of it, for example. The church-like atmosphere described by the script takes on a different meaning when we contextualize it not only with Vamp's origin story, but within the Hollywood vernacular and its traditional depiction of villains as evil, yet causal agents. As individuals with liberty. Bad guys in movies have power and control, only to be matched by their analog, the hero. The only difference between them is one uses their liberty for good, the other for evil. But the idea of evil, unlike that of good, strongly depends upon having faith in the existence of such a thing as free will, at least on behalf of the villain. The same can be said of important related faiths, like the one in history, or even of reality itself. Reality, absolute reality, we differentiate in our folklore from artifice with appeals to the idea of causality, of non-determinism. Things only happen, truly happen, for us if they are a cause for other things to happen, and typically only in a way that could have happened differently. This assumes quite a lot about the world and the human power to affect it. Evil is a way of explaining away why bad things like terrorism or immorality happen to good people. Like any Hollywood drama, it is a story. Evil, to paraphrase Joan Didion, is a story we tell ourselves and each other to live. Or at least it could be. The irony in MGS2's portraits of evil is we, Raiden, used to belong to a child soldier brigade in Liberia called the Devil's Army. Given the nom de guerre of Raiden back then was Jack the Ripper, one of the most infamous serial killers of all time, a name synonymous with evil, perhaps in part because Jack the Ripper's true identity remains even now a mystery, Raiden is named after a murderer who many movies have been made about, yet who could have been anyone whose true identity 
as well as true motives, remain a mystery. The implication in Raiden's case is that he so excelled at killing as a child that he willed to do it, that he butchered for fun, that he was born for the job. This just begs the question, especially in the context of child soldiers, of course. Doesn't being born to do something, even if it's something bad, by definition render the idea that it's being done out of free will, that it's an evil act, an impossibility? The whole point of fate is it's irrevocable. It couldn't have happened any other way. We tell ourselves the story that monsters and murderers harm us in liberty because they enslave us and their victims to the causality of their acts. But what if they're no more free than we are? What if the evildoers, criminals, and immoral sinners of our world couldn't do or be otherwise? It's a scary thought, more scary perhaps than all the famous killers and deviants in history put together. Hollywood helps assuage this fear and hatred by telling us what we want to hear, by showcasing and reinforcing morals, as well as portraying the immoral to absorb our hatred, to become targets of our anxiety. The same is true of the way we use and have designed the internet, not to mention why we love politics. Politics and culture wars in America are about competing narratives, all of which take for granted the existence of evil, of wrongdoing, and the liberty to do otherwise. This is why Hollywood movies speak so centrally to the American value system, which, after all, has evolved in the global meme pool from those of Judeo-Christianity. Another example here in MGS2 is the dynamic between Hal and Emma. It seems worth mentioning that the name Emmerich comes from a famous director, Roland Emmerich, a man known for his disaster films. Hal and Emma are in some bizarre sense another version of Jack and Rose, a more tragic example of Hollywood-style lovers. Like Jack and Rose, their lifelong love for each other is in some sense preordained, fated, Whereas Jack and Rose, though, were arranged to fall in love by the Patriots, E.E. E. and Otacon were brought together by their parents' causal decision to marry. However, while Jack and Rose are the epitome, if not also the deconstruction or parody of the proper moral American heterosexual couple, E.E. E. and Otacon are virtually involved in one of the biggest cultural taboos in America, even if they are step-siblings, incest. Even despite herself, E.E. E. clings to a version of her stepbrother's memory. She can't help but still see him in romantic, even sinfully incestuous terms. The dream she once had of their love before it was dirtied by reality is like a phrase that her parrot will repeat as an endless refrain. E.E.'s e. E.'s death is an example of something so certain to occur it's as good as scripted, preordained, Yet the player races to the Shell 2 core anyway, having faith she'll pull through at the last minute like a Hollywood ending, like Vamp has on multiple occasions. Instead, though she dies cinematically, E.E. E. rather unceremoniously just dies. Nothing can save her from her tragic fate. Maybe it never could. Touchingly, this leads Hal to realize that even though his own happiness, like E.E.'s, e. may have been destined from the start never to arrive, his mistake through life has been assuming that it ever will arrive by him simply waiting around for it like a passive audience member in a dimly lit theater. His speech about going out and at least trying to be happy and make a happy family speaks to the game's wider theme of having faith. We have to still believe in our own liberty, even if it is just another story we tell ourselves to live, even if it's just an idea that we picked up from MGS2 like Raiden picks up his ideas of how to live at the end of the game from Snake. This explains and also complicates MGS2's relationship with Hollywood. Though it may to some extent criticize or satirize Hollywood, MGS2's also a love letter to American movie making. If life in the end is just a story we tell ourselves to make it through, MGS2 seems to say let's do everything we can to make sure it's a good one. 